<clears throat> Hello, brothers and sisters. How's everybody doing? Give yourselves a round of applause for coming out. First Saturday of December on the 1st. We starting it out right here at Everlasting Life. Let's give a round of applause for Dr. Baruch and the Everlasting Life staff for having this facility available for the community to come out and share. Uh, we have a very, very, very special treat. You know what, we need to turn that down. Oh, give me one moment, we're gonna just uh, turn that. Well, I see you. Can you turn the volume music? Thank you. Yes, I'm sorry. So we, um, it's, it's gonna be a very short treat. Um, tomorrow, we're having uh, a double lecture, also a celebration of uh, my 45th birthday. And we are honored, yes, yeah, look, a, a brother from Southeast made it to 45. You should clap a little louder than that. <laughs> I gotta say it, man, everybody didn't make it to 45. I did it, man, I feel good. <laughs> so, um, uh, we have a, a very special day tomorrow. We're gonna be going from two o'clock all the way until the place ends. We're gonna have two different lectures. Uh, then we're going to be playing music, people talking, and doing the things that we do here at Fellowshipping. Uh, we're having, it'll, it, it's, it, the theme of it is African survival in the 21st century. So we're talking about, uh, the, looking at it from this perspective, if you go back to uh, 1492, if the Native Americans had an opportunity to say Native American survival in the 15th century and beyond, they would have had some things to talk about, and they could have been in a better situation than they in. So what we're saying is, we have the tools, the resources, the time, the place, and the people with the knowledge and information to say, hey, look, we can actually look at where we're going. We want to make sure that 500 years from now, we, there's more of us on this planet doing more better things, more family structures, and a better condition than we're in today. So we think this is an important conversation to have now. Uh, you know, with the administration that's in, people understand the times that we're in, I think. So we said we need to discuss it, not be afraid of discussion, have it. So... Two discussions we'll be having tomorrow about, but Rudy will be talking about the path to true black uh, African sovereignty, meaning how are we really going to be independent? How are we going to have what we have here everywhere? Mm -hmm. Where we have infrastructure, where we own it, we're feeding ourselves our own food, we have respect with elders and children in the environment where everybody the same age can be here and we all be comfortable. You know, how do we put this thing back together so that we can actually really truly live out this idea of us being free and independent and working in our best interest. So he's going to do, and the way it came about, I just want to tell this part real quick because I think it's, uh, it's telling. I'm a lecturer, and I've seen a lot of lecturers. And it's very seldom that I see a lecture that moves me so much that I just decide that I got to go through a, a, the process of going to Dr. Baruch and saying, Dr. Baruch, I'm telling you, you have to bring this to D.C. And uh, we had been talking a little bit before that about he wanted to have some of the great scholars of our day here so that our people could have uh, access to them. We were in Houston, and I was doing a lecture with the Baba here. I couldn't even hardly concentrate on what I was supposed to say in front of him. The discussion that he had in Houston, the power of it, was so magnificent. I was like, Baba Baruch, we got to bring the brother here. We have to do it. And he said, fine, you want to bring him here? Let's bring him here. Let's get the people to come out. If you're telling me it's that good, come out. And that's why, that's how we were able to get the Baba here. I said, it's invaluable and the ideas that he brings are great. So he's the premier scholar of the 21st century. He's our modern day version of our Dr. John Henry Clark or our uh, 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 Dr. Amos Wilson or the other greats that were there during the time giving our people this information. As you can see, he has 23 different books that he has authored. Each one of them is super powerful. Each one of them is needed. It's something that our people need. And um, so he has those available today if you want to purchase those as well. And what he's going to do right now, he's not going to do the lecture that he's going to do for tomorrow. But uh, Baba Rudy's going to come up here and going to discuss um, uh, just a little interview that he's going to do with our sister here, Al Kamar, who puts these events together. And the last thing I'll say about tomorrow, then, uh, after Baba does his lecture, I'm going to be doing one about, it's called Mind Your Black Business. I have the first two parts back there about black business, infrastructure, and what we're doing. And tomorrow's theme, the third part of it, is going to be how do we get our wealth back? How do we put this economic situation back together? So uh, at this point, we're going to bring up Bob Rudy for a short interview. I don't know how many of these he's done, but it's going to be very interesting. I don't know what my sister has in store, but she's excellent interviewer. I don't know if you know she has her show, The Empower Hour, uh, every Wednesday from 2 to 3 p.m. So you can tune into it on Facebook, E-Life uh, e Media. E Media. 
uh, on Facebook and watch it there. And without any further ado, I want to bring on the premier scholar of the 21st century thus far, the man of the hour all the way from Atlanta, Baba Baruti. <laughs> It wasn't big enough already. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it, is, it is an honor to be here. This is, uh, I think, the third time that I've been in this space. And what has transpired, what this has changed into, is, is really beautiful. And I know we have things to talk about, but you're seeing this all around the country. There's a thing going on in Houston. There's a thing going on in Atlanta now where we are taking spaces that we own or we're leasing and we're turning them into community events where entrepreneurs are coming and bringing the community. And this is, if you could see what's going on in this country now in our communities in terms of the places where tables are set up and people are bringing their wares and folks are coming through. This is, this is exciting mm. to me. Sometimes we don't see because we're like isolated right. to one place. Right. This is going on all over. This is this is not unique to the, this is beautiful, but this is it's not unique to to here. And I'm I'm thrilled. Yeah. I'm thrilled to see this. Well, thank you, thank you, Baba, so much for joining us. And um, I always tell my brother, it irritated Jeannie, we can't keep pushing the same message and think that it won't resonate. So the fact that you share that this type of event is going on nationwide is a, I think it's a testament to those who push the buy black, buy black, you know, and over and over, eventually it will begin to sink in. So that's, a, that's good news. Thanks for sharing that. Um, again, we're just going to take a few minutes of your time, about 10 minutes, that's all, because I know that you will be here tomorrow for your full-fledged lecture. So everybody who hasn't received tickets, you definitely want to get tickets for that. Um, and it starts at 2 p.m., doors open at 2 p.m. Um, so I just have a few questions for you. Um, Jeannie just mentioned that you are an author of over 23 different books. Wow. So I've, I've only read a couple of your books, <laughs> so I can vouch for them, you know, the ones that I did read, uh, read being phenomenal. So I'm looking forward to digging into even more. Um, question for you, Baba. Did you choose this path? Or did this path choose you? You said 10 minutes, right? <laughs> yeah. um, that's that's a, uh, you know, you get some questions and they're difficult to answer without detail. Yeah. Um, I was not always what people see now. Um, I dropped out of school in seventh grade. Mm -hmm. I did a lot of stupid stuff in my life. Mm -hmm. Drugs, alcohol, the, 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 you name it, the club scene. That was my life for a good number of years. Um, and I really can't say that I can identify any one thing that turned me around. I remember my brother, and DC is home for me. Uh, Northeast DC, rolled up with Rhode Island, South Dakota Cross, right in Mount Rainier, DC is home. I went to, uh, um, wow, went to um, Woodridge, Taft, and then Tech. Okay, that was that was my right. Yeah, that was that was my right. Now at at um, Tab, I was there, but I didn't go to any classes. But I was there for three years. And when I went to Tech, I didn't take one single solitary class. I was the captain of the track team for my first two years. So I was there. I just didn't take any classes. Um, and when we look around now, we have to understand a lot of the children who we see in school who are sitting in the in the classes already, they've already dropped out. Okay, just because you, we're, we're miscounting that because we think that the only people who are dropped out are those who are not physically attending the school. You have children who are sitting in the classroom and they're not there. Um, but my brother came to me one day and he told me that I was going to become an uncle. And I went home and literally looked in the mirror and I said, is this what you want your, I knew it was going to be a girl. I said, is this what you want your niece to see when she grows up? And that started a change process going on with me. Um, and I did things that got me back in school. Um, so I was, um, I got my GED and I finished up four years worth of college in two and a half years. I came out number one in my class 
uh, got a full scholarship to the University of Chicago, got another one there, and things have gone in that direction since then. Um, of course, I tell children today, because we have children today who look at you and say, well, oh, well, you've dropped out, I can drop out too, and then come back. This is a different reality. This is a different world. This is a very different time. I wouldn't want to have to try that. I can imagine what would happen to you if you dropped out in the seventh grade today. It's over. That's the end of the discussion. Um, I forgot your question. You, I would, oh, thank you. Um, I, I think that this path chose me. Um, I was brought up in a home where you were taught that you go where you are needed and you don't lie. You don't lie to your people. And when I became um, a teacher, an educator, one of my first promises to myself was that I'm not going to lie to my students ever. Of course, that cost me a couple of jobs because that doesn't always go down with the administrators well. Um, but it's like you get, it's not a choice because you follow truth. You follow what makes sense. You, you keep going in that direction. And if you're, I think that if you're strong enough, that that path will carry you where you need to go. Um, but it's not you making the decisions you realize later. And sometimes I stop and think now, why did I do that? If I had done it that way, then I could have been in a better position. I could have had more money. I could have, blah, blah, blah. but when you're doing it, you're doing it because it's right, because it's righteous, because it needs to be done. So it's the, the even though you choose the kind of person that you're going to be, that kind of person pulls a certain path for you. And when you follow that path, that's not a path. I don't think it's a path that you choose. <coughs> All right. Um, I've met your um, beautiful wife, Mama Ya, and I've actually um, sat in on one of her lectures when you guys were in town recent, well, maybe a few years back in Baltimore. And um, she too is a powerful force. <laughs> um, and um, so my question to you is how important is a complementary to your own life's purpose? Um, we were talking earlier to two of the sisters and I were talking earlier about uh, the decline of the family in our community. And I think there's a direct connection between that and the state of our existence right now. Uh, there's a reason why our ancestors were family-centered and why male-female relationships were so valued. It's because it takes two to tango. It takes two to do this work. When I look at um, some of the boys who come to our school today, and it's only mom, and this isn't a statement against moms. This is not a statement against women because the first question that should come out of our mouth is, of course, where is the father's at? But when, when we get these boys or should I say when I get these boys, because my job at, okay, we have a full-time African Center homeschooling program, and this is our 20th year. We deal with children from the fourth grade through the 12th grade. Most of the children that we are getting who have issues are the boys. And it's not necessarily discipline issues. A lot of times it has to do with thinking. A lot of times it has to do with willingness to do the work. Um, when you, don't have a man present, a man who acts like a man who understands the importance of providing the discipline. I'm not necessarily talking about pulling out a belt. I'm talking about an ordered environment where people can be, the children can be who they're supposed to be. When that's absent, then you're going to have children who are going to grow up mentally deformed, who are going to grow up emotionally deformed. Um, so I think it's very critical that our men and our women come together and form complementary relationships. I think, I think it's beyond critical. If that, if that isn't changed, if we don't correct that, and Irritated Jeannie and I were talking about that earlier today, if, um, when I was trying to straighten myself out, the, there were a bunch of problems I had to deal with. And logic told me to find the one that was the worst and to work on that, and if I could solve that problem with the other ones still going, then the other ones would fall in place, the solutions would fall in place. If we look at what's going on in our community in terms of the problem and a solution that can correct it, then for us, it should be the man and the woman. It should be complementary relationships. That's, that's the center, that's the core, because if you can straighten that out, everything else will fall into place. 
Our economic situation will fall in place. The issues that we have with our children will fall in place. But you have to straighten that out first. That's an ex that's probably the most difficult problem we have, but we should know whether we think we can do it or not, that if you're going to solve our problem as a people, then you have to solve our problem in terms of our relationships before anything else. Ashay, Ashay, thank you for that. This next question, I, I heard something recently um, online, and I'll quote it. Um, it read, some of you are breaking generational curses, but don't even know it. This is why your attack has been so hard. And this quote reminded me of something you shared one time that stuck um, in my mind um, when I listened to one of your lectures and you shared with us how um, the, the higher we elevate, the, the more pressure we'll receive from our enemies. And, um, yeah, and that, and that resonated with me, but can you elaborate a little bit on that um, for us, please? Well, I think it's only, only natural. If you are someone else's food, if you provide the workforce for someone else, if you provide the resources for someone else, if they depend on you to be who they are, if you decide that you want to stand up and keep your own resources, if you decide that you want to work for yourself, if you decide that you want to stand tall, if you decide you want to create your own society, then the pressure is going to come from them to stop that because they are dependent on you for being who they are. We often forget, and I've, I've heard it from a lot of our uh, warrior psychologists, Amos Wilson, he said it a number of times, that their ego, their sense of who they are is based on our response to them. So if we didn't respond to them in a certain way, then the way that they look at themselves wouldn't be the same. So it's, 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 they are very dependent on us for who they are, for their sense of, uh, well, we say a, a person cannot be a master without a slave. Okay, it, 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 it can't happen. And that even though there may be mitigating circumstances, there may be conditions beyond that, that slave or that enslaved person's control, uh, somebody's got a gun up to his, his wife's head, somebody's got their child, what have you, that may make this slave do or behave in a certain way, but when that's not the case, when you are willfully doing that, then that makes it easier for the master. Now, the problem now, and I would argue that's what's going on now, you have been a lot, of, a lot of black folks, a lot of African folks, they are recognizing their power. There are a lot of things that are going on in the media that are, are making us question the truths that we have been told. And we're responding in a particular way, and we're seeing a lot of things as lies. This is scaring people. This is scaring people. So what we're seeing is really two things. One of the things is uh, an effort to take the anger that a lot of young folks have, which is really righteous rage, it's not anger. Um, and it's trying, to, it's trying to be directed away from the source of the problem so that it doesn't affect them badly. And also the other part is that the level of self-hatred that we have for ourselves, the degree to which we don't like each other, we can't speak each other, that's being um, increased. That's being very much increased. Okay, hey, that was heavy. Um, so with that being said, as you, you travel a lot doing lectures all over, um, do you see, have our conditions improved at all as time marches on or no? There are pockets. In general, um, we're not in good shape. Um, when I do my lectures, uh, that's one of the things that I said. I said, we're in bad shape. We have to be willing to admit that we're in bad shape. We've been, we've been told for so long, don't say that we're in bad shape. You're talking into reality. Don't say that things are bad. No, things are bad. Things are bad. We have children who are alcoholics. Okay? We have people who are getting beat in their own homes for no reason. We have a situation where we're still paying more for the same thing that everybody else is paying less for. We still don't own the stores in our community. Okay? My brother and his wife live in Prince George's County. That's the 
county that has the richest income blacks in the country, Prince George's County. I know, like I said, this is home for me. But we have virtually no stores in Prince George's County. We have virtually no gas stations. We have virtually no books. We, we have virtually nothing. Grocery stores, Atlanta, which is supposed to be the black mecca, which is where I've been living for the last 30 years, the situation is virtually the same. Wow. It's virtually the same. West End, which is where I live, we don't own one single gas station. We don't own one single grocery store. We don't own one single drugstore. We don't own one single virtually anything in the area. And where we exist in these places, we don't own the property. We're leasing so we can be removed at any point in time, which is what we're seeing now because regentrification is a big thing in West End right now. But I see pockets. You know, if, if this was all I saw, I'm sure by now I, I would have quit. This, this would, it wouldn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to try to fight for people who wants to die. Okay. But I see pockets. This is a pocket. When I, I went to the Million Man March, and not because of the excitement about it, but because I wanted to see that many brothers together. I'd never seen that before. But I went to the Million Man March, and when I came in here today, it reminded me of what I saw. Everybody was speaking. Everybody said, hi, how you doing? Every single person who I passed by said something. And I'm, it's, it's, it, was, it was, I guess, like my first day in college here in the South when I walked by this sister and I didn't speak because my mind was on something. I almost got cursed out. <laughs> I had just come from Chicago. Chicago people don't speak. But it's, it's like, this is, this is a pocket. Every time I see something like this, it's a pocket. You have pockets in Atlanta where people are doing phenomenal work for us, and they're, they're making good money, and they're able to survive, and they're able to take care of their families, and they're still loving. It's, it's not an impoverished situation. They're not aspiring to poverty. These situations, um, your program, you lost program, it's, it's, it takes courage to do that. To see this is empowering. Okay, so I'm, when I leave here, trust me, when I leave here and go back, this is going to carry me for a week. This is going to make it easy for me to do my work for a week. I mean, people look at, uh, I say folks like me who do the writing, have a school, blah, 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 and they, they put us on this pedestal somewhere. But the energy for that comes from the community. It doesn't come from me. It doesn't, it doesn't come from my wife, okay, even though part of it does. It comes from the community because the community that's working hard. So yes, I'm, I'm excited about the possibilities. I don't like what I see in general, but I'm excited about the possibilities. Okay. All right. Well, last, but certainly not least, what can people expect to gain from their time spent with you tomorrow? I think I spent the first 10 years of my um, educator career talking about the problem talking about incarceration of black folks, death of black men, uh, single female-headed families, all these things that um, contribute to how bad our situation is. And we're not talking about fault, we're not talking about blame, we're talking about what exists. Um, I've spent the last 20 years trying to put together solutions to these problems. So um, a number of years ago, my wife and I logically came to the conclusion that you can't do this in their space. We can't become powerful in their space. And I'm not, I'm not talking about taking the six states in the, in the South and claiming them as ours or running to the continent because that's still running. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but there needs to be a reason that's beyond just you running away. It's like people will pull their children out of school because of what's going on in the school, but they have no idea where they're going with the children. They have no idea where to take them. They have no idea where to educate them. We have to have rules, guidelines, basics on how to move in a direction where we are sovereign and empowered ourselves. Uh, our great, great, great grandchildren are probably going to decide how that looks. We're not going to solve. This problem is still getting worse. Um, it, it's, it's like a big snowball that's coming down a mountain um, and it's gaining speed and it's gaining snow. It's still picking up speed. It's got to be slowed down then reversed and then pushed back up the hill. It's still picking up speed going downhill. So we're talking about generations of this process. But 
if this is going to happen, then there are certain things that people need to begin to do to create a different type of culture, a different type of climate. We need to bring traditions back, the traditions that work for our ancestors. Ancestors, you're talking about, they go at 10, 20, 30, over 100 generations, and we're acting like a quote unquote society, a civilization that's only been around for 90 some generations is more intelligent than this. Our ancestors were able to do what they did as a communal people because there were certain rules and relationships that existed between them that allowed them to grow as a strong people. We have forgotten that because we have accepted the idea that tradition is passe, it's old, archaic, back in the woods. People who become powerful do not forget their traditions. A, 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 little, a little example of that. When the United States bombed Nagasaki and Hiroshima to end World War II, they devastated Japan. If you see pictures of it, video of it, you see Japanese people walking around in a daze because of disbelief, shock, and pain. Japan now is one of the strongest nations on the planet. The United States is a debtor nation to Japan now. That's why the Japanese receive reparations because of the United States debtor, debtor status. But the Japanese are able to do that because they understand that they are family. They understand and they operate accordingly. Um, every year on the date that the bomb was dropped, there is a day of silence in Japan. Japanese people all around the world for that, it's either a day or an hour, whatever. They are silent in memory of what happened to their ancestors on that day. They don't forget. They don't put any energy whatsoever into forgetting. We are the only people on this planet. And this is to critique, what do you say, constructive criticism. We are the only people on this planet who put so much energy into forgetting who we are, mm. into denying who we are, mm. into acting as if other people's definition of us is correct for us. A people define itself when they say, um, people uh, name things, dogs are named, animals are named. We're not naming for ourselves, we're not telling our own story. Um, so I would say tomorrow, I hope that the folks who are present get an understanding of what we have to do, a, a basic plan layout of things that we need to do in our community. Tomorrow I'm going to focus on um, the military side, if you will. Uh, I'm trained as a sociologist, so one of the things we as sociologists look at, there are institutions in society. Any successful society is going to have certain institutions. It's going to have an economy. It's going to have a political structure. It's going to have an educational system. It's going to have a family structure. Those societies that do not survive, they don't have a military structure because they can't defend themselves in a dog-eat-dog -dog world. We don't have a military. We don't even protect our own communities. And we talk about what come, happens in our communities and folks getting shot. One of the perfect examples to me of a community that doesn't do that is the indigenous people in this land. There was a reservation in North Dakota where the local white boys that came in and they terrorized and they raped regularly on a weekend basis. These folks met them at the gate, dealt some bullets, and that was the end of that discussion. That was the end of that time. And if we think back, we remember when there was a time when we did that. Okay? My grandmother kept a 22 in her brassiere. Every aunt that I knew carried a weapon somewhere because they understood what we were dealing with. Okay. But now, we act like everything is fine. So I want to talk about some of the things uh, militarily that we need to do to begin to move into that direction. You have to change the way people think about things so that it becomes you know, second nature. I, I don't understand. And when brothers thought about it, at first they, they bought, but then they got the point that, yeah, okay, that makes sense. I don't understand you opening the door to let her out first. I mean, that's, that's that chivalry, that gentleman thing, right? Where you open the door so she can walk out. Well, if there's somebody out there in this dangerous world, a world of predators, a world of killers, if you will,
If you open up the door and let her out, then more than likely she's going to be the one who gets shot first. So we have to change that mentality. My wife doesn't walk out the door first. She doesn't walk out of any door first. I step out, and then I hold the door for her to come through the door after I've checked out to make sure it's safe. That's not some, you know, gladiator thing. To me, that's common sense. In this reality, that makes perfect common sense to me. The idea that um, it's prom night, and she's all got her dress on, and she's all beautiful, and she's coming down the steps, and he's walking behind her. She trips and falls. So logically, where should she, he be? He should be in front of her to protect her. If we are the providers and protectors, and I'm not getting into an argument about that. If we are the providers and the protectors, then we have to act accordingly. We have to use our common sense and not just the chivalry and what looks good in the movies, what Earl Flynn or somebody did. We have to use our common sense about protecting our community, about protecting our, yes, our women. They are our women just like we are their men. We have to be about the business of protecting them and providing for the security of the community so the community, again, becomes a safe, sacred space for us. Well, I say, well, there you have it, and that's just a smidget of what you can expect on tomorrow right here at Everlasting Life, 9185 Central Avenue in Capitol Heights, Maryland. Doors open, I believe, at 2 p.m. Let me get the flyer. Uh, yes, doors open at 2 p.m. So Baba Baruti right here, he has all his um, books here as well for sale. So come on out. He's going to be spending a few, um, a couple of hours with us here today. So if you guys are out there in Cyberland and you want to come, um, come on and grab some of his literature. But certainly be here tomorrow for the lecture because it's going to be dynamic and uh, Irritated Genie is going to be following him up. It's his birthday celebration. So come on out and help us celebrate that as well. So again, I thank you so much, so much. Welcome home. <laughs> I did not know you was from the D.C. area. Wow, that's news to me. Okay, and until then, we'll take care of each other out there. Family, peace.